Hello and welcome to Betfred's Football Show. I'm delighted to be joined by Paul Robinson. He was supposed to be in the studio, but the M62 is still closed, Paul. Yeah, I was going to make an effort this morning, but I woke up this morning at half past six. I did drop you a message. I had a look at the weather report and there's a few people that spent the night on the M62 and apparently are still there, unfortunately for them. So I think uh, it was a wise decision for me to stay here as much as I do love coming in and seeing you, Mark. A couple of snowflakes and you lot. Stay at home. Joining a working from home generation. Should have made your way in, Paul, but we'll let you off. Uh, right then, Paul, we've got to start with your old club Spurs. Um, massive disappointment on Wednesday night. Yeah, but I think the, the the disappointment was is they're so predictable. They play the same way. There's no formation change. There's no different style, regardless of whether they're playing Sheffield United in the FA Cup, which was another massive disappointment. Who they play in the league, they're so predictable to play against. When we used to play against teams, you'd sit in the dressing room and you'd wait for the team sheet to come in an hour before the game. Spurs, probably you'd know nine of the ten you were going to play against and you'd know exactly what formation they were going to play. The style of the football, it's just become tiresome. They're not a good watch. The amount of times we've sat in the studio this year and said they're just not a good watch. It's not an enjoyable team to watch. And I just think it's getting a bit too long in the tooth. I mean, listen, you, there's, there's two arguments. Antonio Conte is not a bad manager. Have Spurs made him a bad manager? Did they do the same to Mourinho? Have, have they not had the tools? You can argue was if Pochettino was backed after the Champions League final, that should have been the time where the money went into the club and Pochettino should have had, had the money. But I think Conte, Conte has been backed, but I just think it's got a bit too tiresome for everybody. And I think it's a situation that would work. I mean, it's great to see Antonio Conte back on the touchline after his spell of, of ill health and we, and we wish him well. But you, just, you would just wonder, you saw his interview after the game in midweek against AC Milan and you just wonder, is his heart still in it? Is his heart still there? Or is it a case of he would quite happily move on and step aside if the club wanted to look in another direction? And I think that has to be the case, Mark. I really do. I just, I can't see how this team are going to progress or develop under him. The, the style is, he's got no plan Plan B. It's, it's it, you, watch, you watch them and if plan A doesn't work, they try plan A again, but put Richarlison and Kulisevsky in different positions. It's just, it's just a really poor watch. It really is. Well, a direct question then. Is it time for Conte to go? I think it is, yeah, I do. I think, listen, he's, he's coming to his contract, uh, the end of his contract at the end of the season. And I think that will be the the separating of the ways, if you like, at the end of the season. But then you think, well, why wait till the end of the season? Do it now, see if they can get a new manager bounce and try and get fourth in the league. Once again, another trophyless season, nothing to play for again between now and the end of the season, other than a fourth place finish, which I'm sure the club hierarchy will be delighted with a Champions League finish. But again, no trophies and, you know, beginning of March, end of February, season's almost over apart from trying to pick up league points. A new manager comes in, play a different way. In all honesty, do you know, I, I did the co-commentary for that game the other night against AC Milan. I would much rather have seen us lose 4-3 than draw 0-0 in the way that they did. And I just think a, a new manager with a different style can get more out of these players. Talk about Conte being a world-class manager and, you know, has he got the best out of the players if he's a world-class manager, he's got to get the best out of the players by playing a system that works for them. And like I said, I'd, I'd rather see us go down fighting, losing 4-3, four, 5-4, four, 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 than a, an absolutely dour nil-nil draw. And we had one shot on target, Tottenham, and it was a great save by Mannion, the AC Milan goalkeeper. But it took 96 minutes. No, oh, it was frustrating to watch. You, you, you're watching thinking, just go for it. Right then, who would you like to take over at Spurs and Pop? I think there's a decent list of candidates now. Pochettino is obviously the favourite candidate. And I think we know the relationship that he's got with certain players there and, and Daniel Levy and the hierarchy at the club. But with Pochettino coming back in, there's a case of, you know, do you go back? Is you know, is, do you go back to old ground? I think it was you look at the finishes that he had in the Premier League, second, third, fourth, fourth, third. He took the team to a different level, but also played a style of football that was pleasing on the eye. And Spurs were a good watch back then. You know, there's an argument, do you want your team to be defensively resilient and get results? Or do you want to play decent football and get results? And he played good football and got results. But at the same time, he'll come back after, what, six years, six and a half years, looking at that dressing room, you go, oh, Eric Dyer, oh, you're still here. Ben Davis, oh, you were on the bench when I was here, you're still here. There's certain players in that dressing room that haven't, the dressing room hasn't been evolved. But if he comes back, he has to be allowed to do that and evolve the, the, the dressing room. Thomas Tuchel's out there. Is he another Chelsea manager that could come and we could make bad you know, we've, we've, we've had good success of doing that. Um, but there's a lot of good coaches out there at the moment. You know, Simeone's another one that I'd like to see a top English club go and get. But his style of football, again, is really poor on the eye. Deserve, he's done an unbelievable job at Brighton. There's another one. 
Thomas Frank, excellent. But are Thomas Frank and Deserbi, are they the next Graham Potter if they take the next step to the next level? If you want tried and tested, you, you're looking at Pochettino. I think if you want to appease the fans between now and the end of the season, you, you get the fans' favourite back in. But he's he's had a lot of time off between now and then. Not time off, he's he's worked differently. He's a different coach to when he left Tottenham and Tottenham are a very different outfit to when he left. So would it work? Listen, I, I think it's I think it's worth taking the risk on him in all honesty, I really do. I suppose the most important question now, can Spurs finish in that top four? Liverpool breathing down their necks. Newcastle just had a bit of a blip up there. Can Spurs finish in the top four? Oh, listen, they, they can put all the focus on finishing in the top four. Whether they can do it or not, with the amount of inconsistency that they have, is, is the next question. Liverpool seem to be hitting form at the right time. Listen, I'm not getting too carried away with Liverpool at the moment. They've beaten Wolves 2-0 they've beaten Man United 7-0, which was a freak result. Man United rolled over in the second half. It was 1-0 at half-time. The way that Manchester United capitulated, it, it wasn't of you know, usual, what we would expect from Manchester United. Liverpool has still got a lot to do, but his treatment room's emptying quickly. He's getting players back. His midfield will be a test for him. He's, they've got a huge game against Real Madrid. All of a sudden now, after seeing them put seven past United, people will be thinking, Liverpool fans, and Jurgen Klopp, 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 I'm sure, inwardly will be thinking, we've got half a chance here. We could turn this around. We're going to go, have a go for it. The confidence is high. But listen, one swallow doesn't make a summer, but they certainly are on the road back to it. Liverpool are going to be Tottenham's biggest threat for that fourth place. I think Newcastle, I think they've they've hit a bump in the road. I don't think their squad depth is big enough to cope with what's to come between now and the end of the season. I think the Carabao Cup defeat hit them hard. They've had a fantastic run, a great season so far. It's a big, big test for them. They've not been there and they've not done it before. So for me, it's going to be between Tottenham and Liverpool. And I, I fear to say it that I think Liverpool might pick them. Well, we'll get to see Liverpool first off tomorrow at 12.30 away at Bournemouth. Uh, Bournemouth obviously gutted after that 3-2 three de- three, defeat against Arsenal. Uh, Bournemouth and Liverpool, how do you see it, Paul? Well, it's it's a team that are really out of form, that are struggling at the moment against a team that just seems to be hitting form at the right time of the season, isn't it? I mean, you look at Liverpool putting seven past United that we've talked about all week and are still talking about. The last time Bournemouth went to Anfield, Liverpool put nine past them. So this isn't a game that Bournemouth are going to be looking forward to. This is a Bournemouth team that have conceded seven in the last two Premier League games. They scored the second fastest ever Premier League goal last weekend at Arsenal, but suffered a 97th minute defeat, which is it's going to be a huge blow for a team at the bottom of the table. That They're really struggling for results. They seem to get a little bit, they get their head above water and then they get pushed back under again. They were 2-0 down, 2-0 up against Arsenal and a team like that that's fragile and low on confidence. They played very defensively. They played with a back five, four in midfield and tried to stay resilient. I just think that result last week at Anfield is uh, 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 the Emirates, sorry, is really going to hurt them. And Liverpool, it, it's going to have the opposite effect. They're scoring goals, but the thing is, they've showed up at the back with Van Dijk and Canate partnership back together. They've got five clean sheets on the bounce. So this isn't one that's going to make you a lot of money this weekend if you're only going to back Liverpool to win. So what is your score prediction, Paul? I think it's going to be a dominant Liverpool performance. I think they're going to continue to keep clean sheets. I think you're going three or four to Liverpool, but be clever, be creative with your bet. If you're betting only, put them as part of your acca. They're all, listen, if, if Liverpool lose this weekend, they'll ruin a lot of people's ackers. But put them as part of your acca. Be creative. Three or four to nil. Pick a goal scorer. Always like a centre half from corners. I'm going to go three nil Van Dijk. Three nil Van Dijk. Right. Let's move to the three o'clock kickoffs. Some huge games with significance at the bottom of the table, starting with uh, Everton versus Brentford. All four of Everton's home wins in the Premier League this season have come when they've kept a clean sheet. Is that the key for Everton tomorrow? Well, I think it is because they don't score a lot at the other end, do they? I mean, they're ranked 15th in expected goals this season. And for a team in in the bottom three looking to stay in the Premier League without a recognised striker that's fit every week, I was looking at this game the other day, Mike, and I looked at Ma- Ma- Neil Mopé, 204 Premier League games, 0.39 goals per game. And that's a striker, and that's what they're going to probably rely on if Calvert-Lewin's not fit, which, I mean, it's it's not great for Everton. They had a fantastic result at Forest last week. I think that was a good result for them. Forest, Forest are good at home. For all their woes on the road, Forest are good at home. We've seen them take points off big teams but it's not going to be Everton's away form that keeps them in the Premier League. It's going to be their home form. They're going to rely on a set play. They're going to rely on keeping it tight. We've seen them score goals at home. They've only had six clean sheets all season. And they're facing a Brentford side who we all know 
who are fantastic at the moment, unbeaten since October last year. What Thomas Frank's done there is is brilliant. Looking at their um, record, they've had 127 shots on target this year as well, so they're not goal shy. Um, the, in that run, they've beaten Man City, they've beaten Liverpool, and this is a team at the moment that doesn't lose, so it's a massive ask for Everton this weekend. Score prediction, Em? I'm going to go for a draw because I think Everton can be good defensively at home. Sean Dice will have them organised and I'll always back them to score off a set play. But like I said, the Brentford's last three fixtures, both teams have scored in their last three fixtures. So they're good for a goal, Brentford. And I think they'll get one at Goodison. I'm going to go for a one-all draw and James Tarkovsky to score off a set play. Brentford are unbeaten in their last five Premier League away games. Right then, Ben. Leeds at home to Brighton. Um, well, this is just massive for Leeds, isn't it? They've just won one of their last 12 league games, Paul. Yeah, I mean, I really like talking to you when Tottenham and Leeds are doing well. It's it's not good for me. I mean, they're, they're, in, a, they're in a really poor vein of form. It's an absolute must-win for Leeds. People say there's no such thing at this stage of the season, but you look at the home games that they've got, um, they, they're the struggle away from home, but they, they struggle to score goals. This is a must, must win game. They've scored one goal in five games and that came from left-back Junior Firpo, who probably six weeks ago on form wouldn't even have been playing. He played Rutter as a nine against Chelsea. They struggled. The thing for me with the new manager, Javi Grazia, the biggest threat that Leeds have had all season is Wilfred Nyonto. And he's for whatever reason, he doesn't fancy him. He's not played him. And when he has played him, he, he, he takes him off as, as a sub as a substitute, he's used him as an impact sub. And I think that's affected his form, which is a shame because he's been Leeds' biggest player. Um, they're coming into a game against the Brighton side who, with, with Caicedo signing his new contract, Matoma, Evan Ferguson scoring goals under De Zerbe, looking like they're, they're you know, on, on for European football. They thrashed West Ham last week 4-0. This is a game that Leeds don't want because when you look down the calendar and, and you're in the bottom three, believe me, I've been there and done it a couple of times, you're in the bottom three and you're looking, right, where are we going to pick points up for the rest of the season? And you think, right, Brighton at home, there's three points. And going into that game, the pressure that is on Leeds in this game is huge. And I just don't think they're playing well enough to handle that pressure at the moment. So there's 13 games left for Leeds. So as a player in that position, do you actually lie in bed at night and think 13 games left, right? We've got six at home. We can beat them, beat them, draw against them and be good. Um, or we can get something out. Are you doing that in your head as a player Absolutely. at the bottom? Well, every, everyone does in the team. And the manager tells you not to do it. But I tell you, the first person who's doing it is the manager sat in his office with his coaching staff and they're earmarking certain games where you're looking to get points. I mean, you look at the likes of Manchester City away, Arsenal away, Chelsea away. They're not season-defining games. We talk so often about season-defining games. And you look at the games now and you look, Southampton at home was Leeds' last win. That was a must-win game. Chelsea away, OK, that wasn't one of the defining games. This Brighton game is an absolute must-win for them. And if they don't win, the impact that it has if others around them win, I still think they're playing for one place. I think Brighton and Southampton, uh, sorry, Bournemouth and Southampton are gone. And I think Leeds are playing for one place, which will be their best opportunity to stay up. But I do worry for them, I do. Come on in, scoreline. It's hard for me because it's heart and head. I really want them to win and I want them to stay up. And it's fantastic for the city, fantastic for the area. We talk about this Ellen Road crowd and how fantastic the noise is and playing there. But it can have it can have a flip side, an opposite effect to that. When the pressure's on and it's still nil-nil or you're one nil down after 50, 60 minutes. I, I really, really do worry for Leeds. I think there's a big pressure on them. They're, they're always good for a goal, but I think Brighton are too good at the moment. I'm going to go 2-1 away win, Brighton. And I hate backing against my old club. Let's move on to Leicester Chelsea. Amazing, isn't it? Two results and things are very different at Chelsea now. Obviously, yeah. beat Leeds in the Premier League, and I thought they were good against Dortmund on Tuesday night. I thought they've been good of recent times. I do, and it's amazing them in a similar way to Liverpool. How a couple of results can immediately flip people's thinking. I thought they were good away against Dortmund. I thought they dominated that game. They had loads of chances, but once again, story of their season: can't score goals. I did their game at Tottenham and I thought at spells there, they were good. Jao Felix looked at a different level. Um, Havertz just didn't take his chances. The midfield, Hernandez, he looked good. There were certain aspects of the game and, and I'm driving home, listening to talk sport, listening to the Chelsea fans. He's got to go with this, with that. And I'm thinking, I think there's something there. I really do. But it's hard to back that up when the results have been how they have been. But recent performances, I mean, the, the, the night against Dortmund could be a huge turning point in their season. The it was the fact they had to score goals. 
unlike Tottenham the other night, Chelsea went out and they knew they had to score two goals to win the game and went and attacked the game and went and won the game. And I think uh, Rhys James and Ben Chilwell are a huge part of that. Him going back to a back three with Kukurea, who looks so much more comfortable in a back three, playing with James and Chilwell, who is probably his best attacking options at times. And I think that's that's been a, a big strength for them. I think he's still got a lot of injuries, which probably helps him in a way, because imagine trying to put a training session on with 31 players. You can't keep them all happy. Um, the, the shoots of recovery there at Chelsea. Um, and they're going to a, a Leicester side who are really, really not in form at the moment. I mean, they played Tottenham a few weeks ago and I was there for that game and I was really impressed with them. They had Harvey Barnes, Madison, Tete, the pace that they had, the way they attacked Tottenham. But then they've lost at Southampton. They've lost against Blackburn in the FA Cup. And all of a sudden, they're two points clear in a relegation battle again. And I think that's been the story of their season. Another team that are, are so inconsistent. And at home, the pressure is going to be on them. The pressure really is on Brendan Rodgers. There's a lot said about Brendan Rodgers, whether he's a top manager, whether he's whether he can do it at the top level consistently. I think that his team have got to take a lot of responsibility. Yes, he's lost players, but you look at that Leicester team on paper and you look at the squad, they shouldn't be where they are, but they're a team that are low in confidence. Go on and give us a prediction. As I just said, Chelsea don't score many, but I think they'll score two this weekend again. I think they'll go to the King Power. I think they'll dominate Leicester. A 2-0 win and João Felix is always good for a goal. Right, I'm afraid we are going to have to talk Spurs again. Uh, home to uh, Nottingham Forest. It's not a game that they want. I mean, it's a game that they're expected to win and it's a tough game for them. Forest on the road are historically poor, though. They had a decent result against Everton at home last week. They've lost 4-0 on the road to West Ham and 2-0 on the road to Fulham the last two games. So you would think that this is a game that Tottenham would look to win easy. But you've seen the noises coming out of Tottenham at the moment. I mean, we're speaking now before Conte's done his press conference on Friday. So it'll be interesting to see what comes out of that this afternoon. The comments that Richarlison's made already. Dan Juma comes into the side. He plays Lucas Moura ahead of Dan Juma. So then you go, is he a player that the manager wanted? Or is he just a player that he's been given? There's so much unrest there. The lack of discipline there with Romero getting sent off in the Champions League again. We're relying on Skip and Hoiberg to boss that midfield. And there's there's nothing to play for this season other than fourth. And, and this is an absolute must-win game. This is going to be a really, really difficult game for Spurs. The crowd are going to come after a disappointing Champions League. They're going to turn against the board, which they already have done. Some will turn against the manager. If Spurs aren't one or two nil up early on in this game, it could be a really interesting atmosphere. This is one for all of you guys that like betting in-game. This is a game to watch because if this goes to like 50, 60 minutes and it's still nil-nil, get on Forest. Come on then, give us a prediction now. I, th I, th I think Spurs will win, so I think they'll get an early goal. I hope they will anyway. Um, they've got to get past Navas first, though, in the Forest goal. He's been excellent, hasn't he, since he's come into, into, into the team. They're four points clear of the bottom three, so Forest are still playing for a lot. I think they'll give Spurs a tough game, but I'm going to go 2-1 to Spurs. 2-1 to Spurs. Then we've gone to the um, uh, 5.30 kickoff, which is Crystal Palace versus Man City. Uh, Crystal Palace have failed to score in five of their last seven games. Yeah, they've got to be one of the worst, if not the worst, watching the Premier League at the moment. There's a couple of their games that if they'd taken place in the back garden, I wouldn't have opened the curtains this season. Oh. They really are a poor watch. And they were my outside tip a couple of weeks ago to, to get sucked back into this relegation zone. They're playing against the City team who are flying again at the moment. I mean, the, the win against Newcastle was pretty... Um, you know, pretty normal, pretty standard, dominated the game, as you would expect from them. They've got a big game this week against Leipzig coming up, though. And we all know that that's the holy grail for Pep. We all know that that's the Champions League is what he wants. But at the same time, the five points behind Arsenal. So he's going to approach this game very, very seriously, pick a strong side, because Palace historically have been Man City's bogey team. They've really been a thorn in their side. Palace have lost to Corey, who was sent off last week against Villa, I thought, unfortunately. So he'll be a big miss for them. And I can't understand why they've not scored more goals. Palace, I'm looking at the forward line. Zahar, Eze, Elise, Ayu. They've got the players there, but just the way that they play, that they're, they're just not a good watch. I mean, yes, as much as City changed the team up, I can't see them slipping up. I think it'd be a difficult game for City. And I can see Palace getting a goal because they normally do against City. But I'm going to go for a 3-1 away win. 3-1 to Man City. Like, let's move to Sunday. The game live on Sky, Fulham versus Arsenal. And we keep talking about Arsenal slipping up. We're 2-0 down last Saturday against Bournemouth. An all right result uh, in the Europa League as well. 
for five points clear at the top of the table, Paul. Yeah, they showed character again last night in the Europa League against Lisbon, didn't they? Um, I think the, the manager wasn't too pleased, but what he's got there in that dressing room, the, the team, the togetherness, the camaraderie, it showed against Bournemouth last week. It wasn't their greatest performance, but they're, they're, they're grinding out results and that's that's what champions do. I just wonder if if Mikel Arteta wants that finishing line to come. I think they're a bit like a horse that's two or three lengths clear that's just struggling and he can feel somebody coming behind it and breathing down its neck and wants the finish line to be half a furlong or a furlong near and he's not quite going to get there. This is a big, big test for Arsenal because Fulham are a decent side this year. They're in the quarterfinal of the FA Cup. European European football is a real possibility for them. But there's one big thing. I said it to Matt earlier in the week when we when we did a preview on the Fulham Brentford game. Paulinha at the back for Fulham has been a huge. He's going to be a huge miss. He was missing for the Brentford game and they conceded three. And they, yeah. they really really could do with him against Arsenal on Sunday. I think he'll be a miss. Um, saying that, I do think Arsenal will win. I think it'll be another test for them. Um, local London derby. It'll be a tight game. I don't think we're in for a load of goals. Although Mitrovic can cause problems, I think the Gunners will keep a clean sheet and they'll win one nil. One nil, Arsenal. Right, the game you're going to be out for five live, Man United Southampton. Uh, obviously, interesting last night, bouncing back, winning four one. I suppose Manchester United have got to make sure that they win the next couple of games to make sure that. A 7-0 at Anfield is not a season-defining moment. Yeah, I think last night was huge for them. I thought the way that they performed. Uh, the crowd were excellent last night at Old Trafford. Watched the game, obviously, to work, because I'm doing the game at the weekend. So I watched it closely. I thought Bruno Fernandes played particularly well. He was under a lot of scrutiny, although I do think he should have been sent off. It was an awful tackle on Claudio Bravo, the goalkeeper. And that's the side to his game that I don't like. I think he was really, really good in the game. I thought he showed good leadership qualities which have been brought into question this week. But that little bit of him, that side to the game, yes, it's an edge, but he knew straight away it was naughty. He went over to try and get Claudio Bravo off the floor and he was lucky to get away with that. But the thing for me, the interesting thing was Eric Ten Hag picked exactly the same team against Liverpool. And that's good man management for me. That's like, well, you did it. Off you go and put it right. There was no changes, no rest in anybody. That was, uh, you've embarrassed yourself, you've embarrassed the club, you go out there and you put the situation right. And for me, that was good man management. He, he made a lot of changes in the second half, which is understandable. And I just think it was a good all-round performance by them, what they needed. And with Southampton coming to Old Trafford at the weekend, it's a game, not that they should win, they have to win, that there's there's no option. If they, if they do anything other than win, they'll come in for criticism again. How good is Marcus Rashford at the moment? That was goal number 26. Well, it's his best ever haul, isn't it, in the Premier League? He just looks a different player. Um, all this celebration, what he does, obviously relates to what the manager said to him about concentrating on his football and getting his head down and working hard at what he's good at. And it's it's proved him right. I think he's he's been outstanding this year, whether he plays down the middle, out on the right-hand side or the left. He's just a real threat. He's a real goal threat. We talked all season about Manchester United not having a number nine or a recognised number nine, but he's really carried that burden. Veghorst has come in and he's led the line in the same similar way that Giroud does, occupies the centre-halves, and that's allowed Rashford a lot more space and time behind him. He's been brilliant. He's been one of the best strikers in Europe this year. Come on, Angus, a scoreline for the two o'clock game at Old Trafford. This is like the Liverpool game. There's no value in backing United. Put them as part of an acca. Put be, be creative with your bets. Pick a, a penalty taker. Pick a, pick a, a, a centre half. I'm going to go United four nil and Fernandez from the penalty spot. Right, West Ham Villa also at two o'clock Sunday. West Ham twenty three points, just one point clear of Everton in eighteenth. Yeah, they've struggled, haven't they? I mean, you you think they're coming back? They get a decent result at home, then they go and lose four nil. Uh, at Brighton in a way that you wouldn't expect. They're realistically in a relegation battle when you're looking at the league. They're, they're right down there. Um, and he's got a lot to do, David Moyes. Uh, they had a decent trip to Cyprus last night. They won 2-0 comfortably. You, you wonder what that's going to take out of them. Um, Midweek travel all the way over there. But they're playing against an Aston Villa side who are better on the road than they are at home. You look at what Unai Emery's done, I think four out of the last five is unbeaten away from home. And they they get better results away from home, so it's it's not a it's not a given for for West Ham this weekend. Come on, Ence, score prediction. I think it'll be a tight one. I really do. Villa don't seem to get beat on the road, but West Ham are desperate for points, and I think both managers quite happily would walk away from this this game with a point. David Moyes even more so. So I'm going to go for a one all score draw. And finally, we finish off on Sunday at four thirty. Newcastle versus Wolves, and obviously, I think it'll be interesting to see what Newcastle are like at home after the Carabao Cup defeat, 
And obviously the defeat uh, against uh, Man City, bringing that away run to an end. Yeah, I'm going to be a bit controversial here. I think their bubble's going to burst. I quite like this Wolves team um, under Lopetegui. I think he's got them organised. They beat Tottenham last week, which, I mean, it depends which Tottenham team turn up to, 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 to how you got on against them. But I thought they were good against Tottenham. They lost against Liverpool, drew against Fulham. But I think they're going in the right direction, Wolves. And I just think Newcastle this weekend at home, been up there a couple of times. The atmosphere is fantastic, completely changed. Um, there's there's now an air of a little bit of expectation because with some su- success comes expectation. And it'll be interesting to see how these these players handle it. I think Isaac will come into the side because he's been fit. So I think he's, he's always good for a goal. But a big miss for Newcastle this weekend is Joe Linton. Uh, he's out suspended so that they'll miss him. The shape won't change, but they'll stay exactly the same. Um, I'm just looking at Newcastle's recent results. Lost at Man City, lost at Man- against Man United, lost against Liverpool, draws at Bournemouth and draws at home to West Ham. So, yes, OK, they're still up there and they're still fighting, but I think they've they've got a big test and I just think this Wolves side can be resilient and go up there and get a result. Go on, prediction. To both teams to score, because I fancy Alexander Izak for a goal. 2-1 to Wolves, a late goal from Wolves to nick it. That's a 4.30 game on Sunday. Paul Robinson, thanks very much for your time. Stay safe. Stay indoors until the snow melts. Don't want you slipping over. Now you're getting old. Will do. See you next week. (laughs) Thanks very much to Paul Robinson. If you're having a bet this weekend of football as well, please keep it fun and gamble responsibly.